So let's actually look at what happens in anaerobic respiration in the pathway. Now at this point in respiration, we've, or the glucose has gone through the process of glycolysis. It can't continue any further into the link reaction because there is no oxygen present. But don't forget that in glycolysis, you've actually already made two ATP molecules and NAD, uh, two lots of NAD are actually reduced to NADH. So what happens without oxygen is the py pyruvate that was produced in glycolysis is actually converted to another molecule called lactate. Now the clever thing is that to do this, to convert pyruvate to lactate, you actually need to use two NADH molecules. And we can use the two that were produced in glycolysis. So we're going to use those and we're actually going to oxidize it back to the NAD that we uh, started, that it started out as. This means that that NAD can actually go back into glycolysis again and be reduced and you can produce two more ATPs through glycolysis. So what actually happens here is that this process continues over and over and over again. We're basically just repeating glycolysis as much as we can. Um, what we're getting is we're getting two ATPs each time and we're producing two lactates each time. But those NADs uh, that were reduced in glycolysis get oxidized again to form the lactate and then they can be fed back into glycolysis again. So it's quite a clever system, but it's not particularly, uh, you don't get a massive yield of ATP. We're only getting two each time. But hey, it's better than nothing. And at this point, if you haven't got any option, there's no alternative. Now, the lactate moves into the blood and this lowers the pH of the blood. It actually affects the central nervous system. It's thought that this is a protective mechanism to give the muscles time to recover. So if lactic acid builds up too highly in the blood, it's actually the nervous system that is affected and that will eventually cause you to feel the fatigue and to have to stop. After you stop exercising, um, you will find that you continue to breathe heavily. And this is what we call oxygen debt. The reason uh, you're doing that is to get oxygen back into the blood. And this oxygen is used to oxidize the lactic acid or the lactate back into the pyruvate. Sprint athletes like Usain Bolt, uh, for example, actually run about 95% of a race on anaerobic respiration alone. And if you train hard, what it does is it allows your muscles to tolerate high volumes of lactate before they start to fatigue. You end up with more lactate transporter proteins in your mitochondrial membranes, which results in faster metabolism of lactate, and we need to break it down. Now, anaerobic respiration doesn't just happen in humans and in muscles, it happens in many organisms. And um, another common uh, example of where anaerobic respiration occurs is in a fungus, uh, which is yeast. Yeast is a single-celled fungus. We call the process fermentation. And here is the equation. Glucose goes to carbon dioxide plus ethanol. And we can use uh, yeast in processes such as brewing and baking because of these waste products, because carbon dioxide in, uh, can help make the bread rise, the little bubbles of carbon dioxide, as the yeast ferments um, the substrate. And uh, in brewing, we can use the ethanol as a waste product to create alcoholic drinks. So you use yeast and add sugar, maybe from grapes if you want to make wine, maybe from malted barley if you want to make beer. What's less well known is that this process fermentation actually also happens in plants. And one uh, example of that is in um, root cells of waterlogged plants. Now that's the end of the uh, videos on uh, respiration, but just before we finish, I think it's important to just um, mention a little bit about ATP yield and the comparisons between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. It was thought for a very long time that 36 ATP or even sometimes 38 ATP were produced in uh, aerobic respiration. However, it now seems with more up-to-date research this was actually wrong. It is now thought that two NADHs actually yields about five ATPs and two FADH2s yields three ATPs. And if this is the case, then aerobic respiration would actually yield around 31 ATP. However, some of the ATP is actually used for other reactions and it's not a perfect process. So aerobic respiration probably rarely yields over 30 ATP. 
However, it's still a lot more effective than anaerobic respiration, which as we've said already in this video, only yields two ATP. In terms of the practical work in respiration, you should be familiar with this piece of apparatus, which is a respirometer. There are various types of different uh, respirometers, but they all work on the same principles. You put some small organisms in the test tube, which are gonna be respiring. As they respire, they're going to use up a certain volume of oxygen. Now normally that would be replaced by an equal volume of carbon dioxide, but the soda lime is actually going to absorb that carbon dioxide. And as it does, uh, the pressure will, uh, will reduce as there is less gas in the container, and the liquid, which is in a sort of little capillary tube in the manometer, as it's called, is going to be drawn along and uh, you'll be able to measure that on the, on the scale on the ruler. What you can do to convert that into a volume is at the end of the experiment, you then uh, push the syringe down to put the liquid back to where it was and you can see how much in terms of volume on the syringe you had to use to return the red marker back to where it was at the beginning. Obviously, when setting up a respirometer like this, you've got to bear in mind the control variables, keeping them constant, repeat the experiment to improve reliability, um, and it's important to also consider the ethical implications of using animals in an experiment like this. You can review all my videos on cellular respiration from the following links.